everybody, and welcome back to the Parkinson's Disease Education Podcast. For those of you watching and listening, in today's show, you're going to be hearing from a very special gentleman with Parkinson's disease named Frank Antonacelli. Now, the beginning of this video does have a brief introduction of Frank, so I'll save that for the, the main content, but I did want to let you know a little bit about what you're in store for with this interview. It was a great conversation, and I think that you're really going to enjoy Frank's message of embracing Parkinson's disease. That, that may sound very controversial, but I think that you'll understand what he means once you get through parts one and two of this interview. And certainly part one is going to give you an idea of what he means by embracing Parkinson's disease. You're gonna to wanna to stick around to the end of this video, not only to hear about that, but to also hear about Frank's experience with working with the medical team. I asked him a question about whether he thought a movement disorder specialist was the best choice for someone with Parkinson's disease in terms of what kind of physician to work with. I think you'll be surprised by his answer. I know I was a slightly taken aback myself. Be that as it may, you'll also wanna stick around to the end to find out a little bit about Frank's experience with DBS and how that really changed his life in almost insurmountable ways. With that being said, let's let the video and the conversation speak for itself. And a three, and a two, and a one, and cue music. Bow! Welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Education Show, where we demystify the disease and empower you as the person with Parkinson's disease to reach your true potential. The content contained on this show is for informational purposes only and is not meant to be a replacement for information or advice that you receive from your in-person medical or therapy professionals. If you haven't already, I hope you'll consider subscribing. And for an even more personalized experience, please ask us about our memberships. Now, without further ado, let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Education Podcast, where we attempt to demystify the disease and to empower you as the person with Parkinson's to reach your true potential. Today, I have a special guest on the show. Uh, we have Frank Antonacelli. He is a person with Parkinson's disease. He is also a co-author of a, a book about his journey with Parkinson's disease. I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from him today. And uh, with that said, we're going to bring in Frank and let him introduce himself. Uh, Frank, tell us a little bit about your journey with Parkinson's disease. I saw that you were diagnosed in 2007. Uh, and my first leading question on that was, um, when you were diagnosed at that time, would you say in embracing Parkinson's disease, as your book is titled, was something that you approached from the very beginning? Now, that's a great question. I didn't even know what Parkinson's was in the beginning. Uh, let, let, me, let me just give you a little bit. I was diagnosed in 2007, but actually, I think uh, looking back now, I think my symptoms were starting to surface around 2003, 2004. And uh, if I give you a quick story, uh, yeah, I'm out on the please. golf course. I love to play golf. I'm out on the golf course. I'm at the first tee, and you know how the first tee can be a little nervous for anybody. So at the first tee, I'm standing over the ball. I swing, miss the ball completely. I'm like a 90s golfer, so, you know, I'm not great, but I'm not poor either. So I miss the ball. I'm, I got some buddies standing there, and they're trying to make me not feel badly. So they say, one, you know, just jokingly. So I step back. I kind of regroup, get up again, swing, miss it again. Now I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, what's going on? These are customers or friends, but, you know, something's going on. And I can remember back then I had this feeling that there was like a hitch in my swing, but I didn't, I couldn't smooth it out and I didn't know what it was. So anyway, I get, I regroup, come back the third time, swing again. This time the ball literally does a 90 degree beside me and goes into my two buddies that are standing beside me. So at that point, they pick, give me the ball. I pick up. I say, I'm going to the first, to where you hit the guys hit the ball. I walk up to their, you know, I, I give up on the tee. I go up to their ball. And then from then on, the rest of the day was fine. But it was that thing where I always felt before that my body was, my body and my brain were just not in sync. And I think that was a good indication of it. So, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. was, that was around 2004. Then my wife, I got married in 2004. My wife noticed when I was walking, my arm didn't swing. My symptoms were all right side. So 
my arm didn't mm-hmm. swing. And then I noticed the Italian thing when you talk, you know, Italians, they talk with both hands. Well, I'm talking with one hand because <laughs> my hand's not moving. But that was a little strange. And then uh, the other thing was uh, I noticed I'd be sitting at dinner and the water glass would be off to my right. And I would literally reach over with my left hand to pick up the water glass. And I just thought that was a little strange. So I knew something was up at that point, started to look into it and went to a family doctor. The family doctor ran me through a series of tests that, hey, you really need to see a neurologist, but see a neurologist. And, uh, and then she can, she did, her name was Dr. Mahala. She was a German neurologist and uh, U.S. neurologist. She did the initial evaluation. What I liked about her was, she, and I don't know if they all do this or not, but she ruled everything out that it could possibly be. She said, it's not MS, it's not Lyme, it's not this, it's not that, not ALS, thank goodness. And then she said, I think it's this, she ran the MRI, there were white spots or gray spots in the brain that indicate that. She said, this is what I think you have. And then she said, uh, I'd suggest you have a second opinion. And then that got me down to Johns Hopkins and Dr. Moore, and he gave me the second opinion and pretty much confirmed that. So when he confirmed that, I'm thinking, I I, I had no idea what Parkinson's was, uh, how it affected you whether it was something that was curable and where I was going to be. So I, to, and to answer your question, did I embrace it initially? First of all, I didn't even know what it was. And then, um, no, I didn't embrace it because my thing is typically it's a problem, solution, problem, solution, work hard. If you solve, mm-hmm. if you have an issue, work harder. If you can't solve it, work harder, work harder. Work harder. Well, that doesn't work with Parkinson's. So, the harder I worked and the angrier I got and the more upset, the more my symptoms acted up. So it was about, so that was 2007 and around 2017 or 18, I had some friends over and we were sitting around the campfire talking and it was one of my, I have a team of people that I work with and this was a, a personal healer that I've used. I've used a chiropractor, I have a couple of neurologists. And the neurosurgeon actually did my work. And the mm-hmm. healer's husband was sitting around the fire and he said, you know, sometimes these things that you have are a gift. And if you embrace the gift, you're more inclined to have a different result. And that was so foreign to me at first, you know, embrace. I wasn't buying into that at all. But the more I started thinking about it, and then I kind of started listening to my inner self. And I worked with another person in North Carolina, and we really started working on this thing as, hey, maybe this is a gift, and maybe it's a blessing. And once I changed that mindset, it was like everything changed for me. I stopped fighting it. I started working with it. Things started to get easier. My medication started working better. I'm not saying it was a, you know, it was a be all solution, but. That whole thing, and my mindset's always been a positive mindset, uh, glass half full, not half empty. But I had lost that with Parkinson's. And once I got that back, and then I started visualizing, you know, and positive and thinking positive and acting positive, it really had an effect. So I think I think it goes to the core that the more you can work with your mind to convince yourself of visualization or whatever it may be. I really think they can have an impact on anybody, not just Parkinson's patients. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. And uh, just to recap for a second, it's um, if I heard you correctly, so around 2007, had that initial diagnosis technically, or maybe a little bit before that, but then it was 10 years later that you really had that awakening of embracing Parkinson's disease and, and taking on that new attitude about it. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. so, it was, so it was a 10-year grind. It was a, you know, it was a try this, try that. I'm going to cure this. I'm going to fight this. Everything was fight and war and, you know, going to battle and, you know, and yeah, so it was a bit 10 years. And uh, the other thing I found is the harder I I worked, the better I felt because it's almost like an, an exercise stimulates the brain yeah. and body. But then I'd get to the point where I would work myself so hard that I would practically be passing out. You know, I'd have friends come over for dinner 
I'm working in the yard all day, working my tail off, and I'm feeling great. So it was hard to stop because I felt so good that I'd be sitting at the at the bar eating with my friends. I would be, literally be passing out. I was that tired. So I had to learn. Mm-hmm. That was another thing I had to learn with the embrace. It was you have it's it's almost like a moderation thing that you can't overdo it. You have to find that balance and line between working yourself physically and mentally, but not overdoing it. That, that took me a long time to figure that one out, but I think I'm in, I'm in pretty good shape with that now. Yeah, and uh, and to be clear, embracing, for those listening and watching, embracing Parkinson's, I'm sure Frank would probably agree with me, doesn't mean uh, laying down without a fight. It means uh, essentially acceptance is what I'm hearing and embracing. Yes, and uh, one, one of my... Uh, I. A couple words, I a phrase I use, use it or lose it, obviously. That's pretty yep. self-explanatory, and, and we can get into that later. But the other one is patiently persistent. And that's been kind of a theme of mine that I've used uh, for a very long time. And it's and it's uh, it's just like it says, patiently persistent. You've got to try different things. Some things <clears> may work. Some things not, may not work. Some things may work for a little bit. I've tried all kinds of supplements. I've tried vitamins. I've tried exercise. I've tried acupuncture. I've tried hyperbaric. You name it, I've tried it. And I just, it, it's it's acceptance kind of with a, not a a negative view of acceptance, but a, right. okay, we have this. Now let's regroup. What are we going to do about this? Right. It's not resignation, in other words. Exactly. It's, exactly. Right. Yeah, I wanted to convey that too because I can see the skeptics already saying, "What do you mean embrace Parkinson's? What kind of, you know?" And the way I, um, friend of mine uh, on the channel here too is uh, Ian Robertson. We talked with him a few weeks ago. Had several videos come out, and one of the things that uh, came up in our conversation was the fact that um, with Parkinson's disease, it's not the end of life; it's the beginning of a different life. Yeah, very good. Yes. And that's what I felt when I got the DBS um, because, yeah. well, it, actually the DBS, but there was a time before that too, that it, I felt like I got a new chapter with the Parkinson's medication, different people work with different medications, but I, I, the medication that's worked best for me is the carbidopa levodopa for the cinnamon. Mm-hmm. And with that, when I first started working with Dr. Mihalik and she had diagnosed me, we start out with Requip, and she, we went very small, like two, four, six, eight, ten milligrams. Nothing happened. Then all of a sudden, we introduced Cinnamon or Carbidopa Levodopa, and at that point, this is probably two thousand eight. It was almost like a light bulb or a light switch went off in my head. And the amazing thing about that was, and it was just a small dosage. It was like I don't know, twenty five, one hundred or something. I had a couple times a day, but. That veil that I felt, that masking, you know, that common masking. And that was the issue with me. The thing that I struggled with the most with Parkinson's was I kind of had a playful, happy-go-lucky personality. And that wiped all that out. And even like right now, if you look at me, I don't feel that masking. I don't feel like I look. I feel kind of happy, you know, and took my smile away. Right. I took my personality away. And I can remember one time walking in Harrisburg down the street and... I'm just walking along and this stranger comes up to me and says, what's wrong with you? It was almost, what's wrong with you, little boy? Did you lose your dog? And I'm thinking, you know, she said, it's not that bad. You know, what's wrong? It's not that bad. And I'm, I am I walked away and I thought, she's reacting to my face because I had the masking thing going on. And uh, that, that, that's what it really hit me was what you're projecting is not how you feel inside. And that really, that's been the hardest thing. The thing with Parkinson's, it's, it's mental, it's physical, it's emotional, it's all those things, and it's all those things at different times. So that's the biggest thing that I've had to try to, you know, the embracing to me and is if you're having issues with your walk, you know, address mm-hmm. your walk. If you're having address issues with whatever, you know, work on that and, uh, you know, and uh, – but it's a battle. It's a daily battle, and it's uh, it's not easy. But uh, it, it it it's like you said. It's a new chapter, and it, it can be won. In terms of one, meaning it can, you can improve your quality of life, and I believe you can almost have the quality of life that you desire. You know, 
you may have to make some changes or modifications, but in terms of your expectations. But uh, again, I don't I don't like to use the word can't, won't, don't. Those words right. resonate with me, resonate with me. And actually, that's why my movement disorder specialist and I got along so well. Joe Green, who was my movement disorder specialist, who was referred to me by Johns Hopkins and Dr. Mari back in 2008, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I came back to Harrisburg and Joe and I almost started working right away. We worked anyway from three days a week, sometimes four days a week. Then we'd go to one, we'd do different things. But Joe had that football background and that mindset of perseverance and mental toughness and overcoming adversity. And we just hit it off from the very beginning, got very close. And uh, he became almost a, a life coach and a personal friend. And uh, he just had that, you know, that Jim Valvana, don't don't quit, you know, don't give up, don't ever give up. And uh, that, again, that, that works for me. And uh, we just tried different things and different techniques, but uh, it all was around attitude and, uh, and working out. Yeah, and that's fantastic because Joe, even though he's a movement disorder specialist, he's a physician, he sounds like as an individual is the perfect fit for you. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And, uh, you know, I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't share with a lot of people, um, but I did share with you. And that's another thing I would encourage people is to to really, when you're hiding the fact that you have Parkinson's, it's like the elephant in the room. Everybody knows there's something going on that you have an issue. So the more I tried to hide it, the more my symptoms surfaced and I would have gait issues with my walk or my tremor or, uh, you know, my jaw tremor or whatever, but uh, you can't hide it. And uh, once you acknowledge it and then you work on developing strategies and plans to address it, it's almost like the weight of the world is lifted off your shoulders. And uh, that was yeah. a real releasing feeling for me, a, a feeling of freedom almost, of freedom and feeling a sense of relief that I didn't have to hide this. And you'd be surprised how much friends and family, once you get them in the loop, how much They'll help you and how receptive they are. And they don't know anything about Parkinson's. So really, you know, it's an opportunity for you to, to educate them and to, to share with them as as you work through these things. So people are there. They want to help. They don't know how to help. And the more you keep it to yourself, the more awkward you make it for yourself and other people. Yeah, I 100% agree with that based on other stories I've heard and people I've known. And people are more empathetic and compassionate towards a condition they under, they may not understand fully but they 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 know and understand that you're going through something mm -hmm. um, so that that is a very good point you bring up about trying to hide it um, and a, a question about uh, Joe again and or maybe it's a little more broad than that now Joe um, as an individual was a great fit for you a lot of a lot of it was background related with football and sports mm -hmm. and so forth but even beyond that if you were to and i realize this may be a little more general than you can answer but if you were to to re speak to someone who is just diagnosed with parkinson's why would you recommend if if you do to see a movement disorder specialist let's say over a regular neurologist yeah i, I would uh, i would no i would not recommend that i would recommend family doctor and then neurologist the issue with neurologists is unless you live in an urban area, it's very difficult to find what I've been told, find very uh, highly qualified and competent neurologists. My first one was super sharp. Uh, Dr. Malik, Marie Mahalik was super sharp. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mori, obviously from Hopkins, and now he's out in Nevada. He's out with uh, Cleveland Clinic. He's establishing a Cleveland Clinic out in Las Vegas. But um, no, I... I, I would, uh, it, I'm just fortunate that once Dr. Mahalik retired in 13 or 14, I went through like a four or five year window where I tried different neurologists. And I, if I would have had different care back then, I probably would have not had some of the issues that I had later on. So um, right. I, I would recommend a team approach. And then I got okay. to Hershey Med, Penn State Hershey, started working with Dr. DeJesus, who was my lead neurologist. And Dr. McInerney was the neurosurgeon. The reason I was supposed to work with Dr. Falowski, Dr. Steve Falowski from Lancaster, he uh, he was amazing. And and then uh, he their practice uh, changed 
right before we were ready to have the surgery. So he was kind enough to get me in the loop with Dr. McInerney. But I would recommend a team approach. I would recommend neurologist. Obviously, the neurologist would recommend a neurosurgeon. I'd recommend a, And then if they said a movement disorder specialist, which that's what J- the Johns Hopkins and Dr. Marty said, they said, hey, we think you'd really benefit. He was a young guy like myself at the time. I was 40, 43, I mm-hmm. think. And we just had that, we had a bond, a common bond. So that's important too, that you have a bond, you have the same philosophy, the same person. If you didn't like working out and you weren't into it, Joe wouldn't have been the guy for you or the girl for you. But uh right. You know, we I think they had met with Joe, they knew what Joe was all about, and they just knew that we'd have a chemistry and and, and it would work. But I would also recommend I've worked with several, I don't know what they call them, psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever. But when my uh, mom and my wife passed, I used yes. that resource to get me through those difficult times with a professional that could accelerate that process. And then I just stayed with that. It really wasn't for help. It was more for validation. But I stayed with that up until 17. I moved in 2017 to where I am now. And then I got hooked up with another individual and I've worked with her. She's from North Carolina, Dr. Uh, well, it's Susan Renches. And she wrote mm-hmm. something called Third Eye Blind. And third Eye Open, I'm sorry. Third Eye, third Eye Blind is the rock week, of course. But uh, <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I know uh, that name. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would recommend the mental part of it. Maybe not that you need it, but it's a good resource to have. And she's been incredibly helpful for me. And I think she's helped me through. It's almost like layers of an onion where we've peeled back some of these issues. And as we address them here again, it seemed to help my symptoms get better and she's easing things. So I think there can be a lot said to, to uh, the mental aspect of Parkinson's and really having uh, a plan and tools to deal with that. Other than just medication, which I'm not a big fan of. I mean, I recognize- Absolutely. You, you bring up a really good point about the counseling or psychotherapy or whatever you, you have, because you obviously dealt with loss in a very big way in a short period of time uh, with, with the passing of, of Allison and, uh, and your mother in close proximity. Um, so that's a, that's a lot for anybody, but you're dealing with that loss in the midst of a disease process that includes depression, anxiety, apathy, all those things. And, and so you bring up the point of therapy. And I think that's a really great point because I mean, obviously in your situation with loss, but even without that, even without tragedy, um, dealing with the everyday symptoms that can creep in of depression, apathy, and so forth. That's something that is not, well known in terms of non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, at least not to the lay person. So that would be a good place to start even early in my argument, early in the diagnosis to have that, that professional help in dealing with some of the mood and behavioral issues that can come up. I would totally agree. I mean, I remember when Allison (laughs) would be flying out to Chicago, this was 2012. Uh, I've had Parkinson's for five years the symptoms were semi under control because of the carbidopa levodopa introduction. But uh, that was just so, I mean, to think now that I went through that, there was only, uh, you know, divine intervention and through, if I, if I would have been focusing on myself at that point, I would have never made it through, but it was focusing on what's the next step, how can Allison and I, battle this and what's our approach and then obviously faith was a very big piece for me and her as well yes and then uh, i'm a believer so i definitely agree with that part um having that uh spiritual aspect of everything i mean even if even if it's not christianity having that uh, biopsychosocial approach to this disease process yeah. um is important something i wanted to ask you to um well, you had mentioned DBS earlier, and I wanted to kind of get your opinion of um, essentially from before DBS up up and following having it placed, turned on, how would you say that your life has been impacted or changed since you had DBS? Um, obviously, you had, had you you must have been getting to the point where medications were less and less effective. 
Yeah, I ran into a point in the end of two, well, 2019, and then as 2000 went on, my anxiety started to go through the roof. So we started to address that with different medications and trying all those kind of things. And at that point, the medications weren't working. And then my uh, my carbidopa libido, for whatever reason, wasn't working. I don't know whether it was stress or a combination, but whatever. So in February, I got to the point where I had a friend come over. I was in pretty bad shape, meaning I didn't want to go out of the house. I was that bad. So I had this yeah. anxiety of just anything. I practically hyperventilate going to the right aid to get my medication. So he came over, we went to Hershey and Hershey Med, checked in for the weekend, came out of that and literally went home and I had a PTSD moment. Well, it wasn't a moment, it was three months. I came home the next day, I couldn't get off mm. the chair. And I went three months with 24 seven care. I, I literally couldn't stand up to go to the bathroom. Wow. So went from there to, that was February, March, I had 24 seven care through June, July, I had an incredible amount of help with friends, two friends, Will and Linda Mallory and Tom and I, as well as other friends and in a home, home care organization. But anyway, we got me back from literally not being able to get off the chair to being able to get off the chair being able to walk around with a walker around my bar in the kitchen to mm -hmm. walking down the street. And, you know, so this was kind of a process. And as that was going on, that made the option of DBS. It was either it was DBS or nothing for me. So up until that point, I would not have, con well, I didn't consider it. I didn't really want to do it. It just seemed too scary for me. Now I really didn't have a choice. So that's what brought me to the table. And then I had to go through all these tests and got to a point where I was a candidate for it, thank goodness. And I, I do remember I went to have see a doctor in Lancaster, Dr. Mangus Kumar. And I, up to that point, I hadn't seen the MRI that I originally had mm -hmm. back in 2007, eight. So I, I was expecting Swiss cheese when he looked at that. And he... Look at you say, yeah, this doesn't look that bad. I think you're going to be okay. He said, very little deterioration. Once I heard that, you know, it was just like, Phew. so, so then uh, went through all the cognitive tests and had the DBS. Like I said, I was originally supposed to have it in September. It was COVID 2020. So first I was supposed to have it right. in June. Then the COVID thing moved it to August. Then it was moved to September. So this whole time, it's almost like, I'm racing to this finish line. They kept moving the finish line on me. So I get through that. Then it was September. And then finally, in November, it was the day of the election. I remember November 2020, I had the surgery. They put the mm. DBS hit in. And it's too, uh, I don't know if you can see, you can really see, but uh, they put the connectors in your brain. And then mm -hmm. there's a generator here. And it was a two step process. Dr. McInerney did the brain for part first and then did the uh, generator second over a month. So, that, so now we're into um, February, January, February, 2021. Literally after you get the generator put in, you go back in for a consult and they start tweaking it. Well, it's amazing. They're sitting there with a computer and you can see your tremor go, you know, it goes from a tremor to nothing. And, and it's all with this computer. So, it was, yeah, we wanted to the, the issues we wanted to address with me with the DBS, which wound up being successful. And Dr. McInerney felt they would be was we wanted to reduce my on off times, which were just killing my quality of life. Right. And hoping to address my gait issues, my right foot, my, my right foot and leg gait issues. And we've done a pretty good job with that, too. And also the cramping in my foot. So that. It was literally like a game changer for me. It was a it was a new beginning, a new life for me, a new chapter, as you had said before. And then what we did was we had to tweak it a little bit two or three times over the year, 2021. And then when we got to 2020, I was pretty much on my own. They gave me the ability to, to change the settings myself. 
It's a Medtronic mm -hmm. system. And uh, it's been uh, a game changer for me. And the thing I found is because your body is never the same every day, it's constantly in a state of movement, you're not going to find perfection. So once I realized that you try to do an optimal kind of level with the system and I stopped playing with it so much and got comfortable with it and then used things like breathing and prayer and exercise, I leaned on those more than the system. It started working even better for me. So I don't think I've ch I haven't changed the system since November of last year. And it's interesting because I think they said the battery life would be like a three to five year. Does that sound about right? I can't remember now. But anyway, when you look at your system and pull it up. Not right. Okay. When you pull it up, it gives you the battery charge. And I'm almost at full charge. So that says to me, and I think I started at like 1.9 and 2.0. And now I'm at the 2.0 into 2.5. And the other one from one nine to two two. So I've only had to change a little bit. And that's not saying I'm gonna be stubborn and I'm not gonna make these changes and I'm gonna live with these. It's because I've been able to control through supplements and all these other things, exercising mm -hmm. and, and, and embracing. I've been able to accept those things and and and, and the mental aspect. And I think that's uh so literally, like I said, to the game changer, I would talk to anybody I could about it. If they're on the fence, a few of issues. And it depends. I, I think the DBS works for certain things and other things it doesn't. I'm not keen on which ones it helps and which ones it doesn't. But they said for me, the movement and the on time would improve. And then they did. So I was very happy. If you stuck around to the end of the video and you, you're seeing this message, thank you so much for sticking with it until the very end. I wanted to invite you, please, again, be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring and shake that notification bell so that you get notified of when part two drops here on the channel. If you're interested in finding out and listening to the whole conversation, be sure to check out our channel memberships. You'll get early access to the entire 54 minute conversation with no interruptions. But until then, I'll catch you in the next video where we drop part two. Be empowered, catch you then.